Thank you very much. So um, this is my third time I've had the opportunity to lecture at the Sanibel Symposium. Usually I'm doing it for my study at home in Toledo. Um, it's much better being here, I can tell you that for sure. Um, again, I'd like to thank Humanetics for the opportunity and also the Sanibel Symposium Committee that organizes this. They do a fantastic job. And I really uh, I want to thank everybody for this opportunity. Um, we're going to. technical difficulties here, folks. I'm sorry. And hopefully this will work now. So these are my disclosures. So today I want to talk about why, when, and where we started with TEG, and what is its value, and what it, what it exactly entails. What does it mean? Also, um, the early clinical impact, and that will be an abbreviation of a major paper that was published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery approximately three years ago. The financial impact of TEG. Then we have a kind of a decade of use of TEG that I want to talk about and show you. And then basically uh, the impact of platelet mapping that it's had at least in one portion of our, of our practice. So if you go back to 2010, our perioperative coagulation management was we get a ACT post-cardiopulmonary bypass. You had the surgeon's clinical judgment. And if the patient was felt to be coagulopathic, we might get crazy and order 50 whole milligrams of protamine. And we were always scared to do that because we were always told protamine's bad stuff after you give a certain dose. We would blindly transfuse two units of FFP, 10 units of platelets, and 10 units of cryo. And if the coagulopathy or bleeding persisted, we would repeat that. Well, um, remarkably, that, that's not the greatest management. It's shotgun approach. You're really not treating a specific coagulopathy. You're treating the entire realm of coagulation problems. And, and that really is a problem. And it's remarkable to me that as I go around the country and find out, this is still pre a prevalent way of doing things today, remarkably, in 2022. There's no way to accurately determine if there's coagulopathy or unrecognized surgical bleeding. As a surgeon, I know there could never be unrecognized surgical bleeding. It's got to be the perfusionist's fault. Um, obviously, the large blood product volumes and transfuse, they adversely affect the lungs, kidneys, and the heart itself, leading to increased morbidity and certain mortality. So after a little head scratching and some research, we decided to start with TEG. Our timeline was in 2009, we did our initial investigations into both TEG and Rotem. And in 2010, we completed the purchase and shakedown of TEG. We were fully clinically implemented in 2011, including the surgeons being knowledgeable of it and the perfusionists being expert at running it. Since 2011, when we started our program, we've done almost 22,000 TEGs. We performed almost 3,000 platelet mappings. So what is TEG? And we've already had a little bit of a talk about that. The two machines that exist, the, the TEG 5000 and the 6S are listed on the left-hand side of your screen there. We're still using the TEG 5000. Basically, it is a global assessment of coagulation. All right, it allows you to assess um, platelets, FFP, cryo, everything. It can be a point of care place. It is a point of care uh, assay. Ours reside right in our pump rooms. People have them in the labs. Uh, people have them in ICUs. As long as it's a responsive place, and what I mean by that is it's some place that recognizes this test needs to be done now uh, with some uh, urgency, and as, as long as it's done well and urgently, it's fine. It works perfectly. It identifies the risk of bleeding thrombosis and thrombolysis, fibrinolysis and specifically helps to identify the need for specific individual blood components or even extra protamine requirements as necessary. That's something we didn't have in 2010. So he's a, this is a picture of our pumps, or our pump room and the tag machines that sit in it. We've got the same old computer sitting there that's been there a long time. 
So how does it work? How does tech work actually? So basically, <clears throat> you put an aliquot of blood in here, there's a pin that spins, and as the, sp as the pin spins and the clot forms, it binds to the cup, and basically it displayed out as a graph, the resistance in the pin. And this is kind of what a normal tag diagram looks like. You've got the initial phase, what we call the R value here. This is the angle. This is the MA or the maximal amplitude. And they all measure different things. This is kind of a cartoon drawing of what they measure. So the R value measures the need for FFP or a prolonged anticoagulant effect, specifically heparin. When you start looking at the angle, it looks at fibrinogen and often the need for cryo or fibrinogen. And then finally, <clears throat> um, when you get to this portion here, the maximum amplitude of the, amp of the clot, this measures platelet function. Now, if it starts to diminish, this is measuring thrombolysis. So for me as a surgeon, the things that are most important are the R and the MA. Those are the things that are most important, and you'll see why later. So the timing of TEG, we, we talked a little bit about this just a few minutes ago. All of our cardiac surgical patients get a, a TEG performed while they're on the table going to sleep, period, every one of them. The first TEG is drawn with the ACT 10 minutes after protamine is administered. If the patient is felt to be coagulopathic, or has received empiric blood products, say platelets, for a known low platelet count, a second tag is often performed before they even leave the operating room, regardless of how good or bad their coagulation status looks in the surgical field. In our cardiac surgical intensive care unit, if greater than 150 cc's of blood chest tube drainage is, performed, is obtained in an hour, our nurses know immediately to call for a new tag. So I think that what I can't tell you about is that the serial tags are critical and seeing the dynamic changes that occur and in patient's coagulation profile after cardiopulmonary bypass. The classic one is we'll do a morbidly obese patient with a BMI of, say, 50 or so. A patient comes out, looks dry, looks good, and then two hours later they're putting out 300 cc's an hour and they've got heparin rebound. When you do a TAG, they don't need FFP, they don't need platelets. They need another 100 milligrams of protamine and it's fixed. So that's, a, that's an answer we did not have in 2010 and that patient would have most likely continued to bleed and go back to the operating room. That's all gone now. So the team members are, are pretty straightforward. The cardiac surgeons, our perfusionists, our anesthesiologists, our clinical laboratory service, which oversees, and then obviously the hospital administrator who gets to write the checks. So the keys to success in our institution have been having the tag in the operating room for a real-time assessment. I mean, I'm not kidding you. They walk out of one room, they walk around the corner, and they're in our operating room. So it's very, very, very easy, very fast. It doesn't mean it can't be at the lab, but it's just got to be done with some degree of urgency. It can't sit on a lab desk for half an hour, 45 minutes. The physicians have to believe in it. And sometimes that's a difficult thing to do <coughs> for um, uh, surgeons. We're, we're, we tend to be a little bit egotistical occasionally, um, and uh, I think that once, we, once, you, once you show them once or twice that this really works, you know, we gave another 100 of protamine, which we never would have given before, and they stopped bleeding, or we gave one platelet, and it stopped, that's it. That's what's important. You have to have a well-trained staff to operate and interpret the tag. Tag is not hard to interpret, but you've got to make sure you do it right. Obviously, you've got to work closely with the lab, and you've got to perform QCs, and our QCs are still done every day. This was a paper that we um, published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery in 2019, um, and it's <clears throat> a little bit of, a, of a, a complicated study that I want to explain to you folks and show you some of the basic results. We called it our complex cases. They were complex cardiac surgical patients who underwent procedures at Toledo Hospital. They included multiple valve procedures, valve cabbage procedures, aortic root, and aortic arch replacements. It was a retrospective analysis of 681 patients. In the pre-TEG era, 2008, 2009, 367 patients were included. And in the full implementation of TEG when we had buy-in, 311 patients were included. Minimally invasive and circ arrest cases were excluded. So we had the same three experienced surgeons doing these cases. 
We had the same six experienced perfusionists. Transfusion triggers, for the most part, were identical throughout the entire study. Perfusion equipment, oxygenators, <clears throat> pump circuits were all identical. So we looked at the comparison of specific blood, perioperative blood use and product consumption, length of stay, re-expiration, readmission, and overall six-month mortality, and then some basic hospital costs uh, for this study. So when we looked at the blood product use, FFP, RBCs, and chronal precipitate were all statistically reduced compared to the pre-tag period, and it was highly statistically significant. Platelet use was also reduced, but to a much lesser degree and not statistically significant. Overall blood product use was significantly reduced by 40% in the perioperative period and for the entire hospitalization. Again, highly statistically significant and allergenic transfusions were significantly reduced, again, statistically very significant. When we looked at reoperation, length of stay, and readmission mortality, re-exploration for bleeding was cut in half. And this is a group of patients who you'd expect to have more bleeding because they're big cases. Length of stay, we lost about a day, day and a half highly statistically significant. Readmissions re were not statistically significant, and overall six-month mortality was also statistically significant. Again, TEG itself didn't do that. TEG reduced the transfusions, which contributed to the mortality and morbidity. Then we looked at the financial aspects of it, and we did this in a, in a number of different ways, and uh, for this talk, we're gonna talk specifically about blood costs and blood charges. We didn't get into we did get into reoperations and we did get into hospital length of stay, but for this specific talk, I'm just going to talk about charges. So for costs, I mean that's the cost of a hospital buying the blood. We save $700 per patient. If you extrapolate that out to the 680 patients in the group, we save $360,000. These are hospital costs. And if you extrapolate that out through 2019, we save $1.6 million. And these are just the complex cases, which make up approximately 20% of our overall cases. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the charges, now we're talking a couple million dollars. Average blood saving in charges was 4,000. And this is what the insurance company sees, charges. Total blood product for the charges in this study group for those two years, each year, $1.5 million. Extrapolated out over to 2019, Two million, oh, excuse me, 11 million, 12 million dollars. So we, we, we saved a lot of money here. And believe me, our administrators noticed this very quickly. Recently, we've done a study, <clears throat> and it's being revised for the annals of surgery, on our longitudinal impact of TAG throughout the entire 10 year period. Did we continue to use TAG effectively over this period? Did we demonstrate continued improvement or did we slip? And what was the projected cost savings over this 10-year period with the use of TAG? So the study cohort was 1,049 patients pre-TAG and 4,500 patients post-TAG. And this is what they were made up of. Complex cases were 33%, isolated valve 17, and straightforward coronaries were 50% a total of 5,500 patients. We have almost 7,000 patients in our TAG database, so we've gotten a lot of data out. This again excluded minimally invasive, circulatory arrest, and off-pump cases. So we looked at blood product exposure over the course of the 10-year period. It went down statistically significantly, highly statistically significantly. When we looked at perioperative transfusions for each component, Red blood cells went from 2 to 0 0.5 units. Platelets decreased significantly. FFP decreased significantly. And cryo was almost non-existently used in our hospital at this time. All of them highly statistically significant in the decrease. Then we looked at reoperations. 
and I'm sure all of us can appreciate this at 2 o'clock in the morning. We looked at it and it went significantly down and stayed down. Our current reoperation rate for the last for last year was 1.8 percent for all comers. National average is five. So when we look at the impact in a tabloid form, allogenic transfusions were decreased by 28 percent, packed red blood cell use by 74 percent, FFP by 83 percent, cryo by 92 percent, platelets by 24 percent, all highly statistically significant, and reoperations <clears throat> decreased from 6.1 to 2.5 percent overall for the entire group. Again, highly statistically significant. So some general conclusions here, both on this big study and the first one we did the complex cases. It's a global, TEG provides a global coagulation overview. Um, it directs specific blood component therapy, which is what we were looking for, and secondary protamine requirements, which are really critical. Our most common intervention, without a doubt, is additional protamine. So the keys to success in our institution, located in the OR and performed by an expert staff and physician buy-in. We've demonstrated significant reduction in overall blood product transfusions and exposure, reduction in reoperations, length of stay and six-month mortality, significant cost and charges savings from blood product acquisition, reoperations and reduction in length of stay. And we estimate over the last nine years, we've saved $45 million in charges to Toledo Hospital, from Toledo Hospital. That, that to me is serious money. We basically have continued to show improvement in our transfusion rates and reoperation for exposure and blood, excuse me, reoperation and exposure rates. And the role of TEG in this has really been a cornerstone. So when you really come down to it, the question is, is why isn't everyone not using TEG? So related to the question we answered earlier, the biggest uh, thing that can happen in market share is more surgeons accepting it. Before I finish, I want to do another little quick thing here on TEG and platelet mapping, which uh, has been a great, we have time for that? We're okay for time, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. So, Platelet mapping overcomes the limitations of just thrombin-generated viscoelastic testing, and it measures the ability of the platelet to specifically participate in the clot, and it can be affected, obviously, by antiplatelet therapy, um, and that's what's important. Um, when we use the platelet mapping, we're looking at this, how well is our platelet function responding to their antiplatelet drugs, what's their effect on overall coagulation, and what is their risk of bleeding during surgery? So the TEG platelet mapping basically is four separate assays, a little bit complicated here. The first one is a thrombin assay, this MA assay, and produces a thrombin in response that's act activate the platelets and cleave available for fibrinogen. The next assay is blocks all the thrombin and uses a special activator to demonstrate clock strength coming from fibrin. And then finally, the MAADP and MAA are used to determine how much there is of inhibition, inhibition. Really the only one that's important to me, for the most part, is the MAADP, because that's the one that deals with Plavix. Everyone's on aspirin, so we don't, we don't we just go with aspirin. Aspirin's not a problem, it's Plavix that's a problem. We looked at the effect of TAG on platelet, and platelet mapping on the timing of surgical intervention for patients requiring urgent coronary bypass surgery who are on dual antiplatelet therapy. Dual antiplatelet therapy is kind of a mainstay. Aspirin and <clears throat> Plavix after every stent. Aspirin is 75 to 325 milligrams and Plavix routinely is a load of 600 and then 75 milligrams every day. These drugs are irreversible and it has been recommended that Plavix be discontinued five days prior to the institution of a major operation to avoid perioperative bleeding. It's actually a malpractice question to be perfectly frank with you. The individual responses to, Plav to Plavix suggest that about 30% of patients are non-responders, but you really don't know who they are until you test them. We retrospectively reviewed a number of patients from over seven years, 
treated with aspirin and platelets, excuse me, with asking the aspirin and Plavix, dual antiplatelet therapy, to had required urgent coronary bypass surgery and looked at their platelet function and inhibition. Urgent was defined as a need for surgery during the initial hospitalization for an end STEMI, unstable angina, or critical coronary anatomy. Basically, the patients could not be discharged to home. Four surgeons, seven perfusionists, two institution, and the TEG 5000 was utilized. Characteristics of length of stay, complications, reoperation, blood product use were evaluated as a function of the discontinuation of dual antiplatelet therapy. 226 patients we found were eligible. 152, or 70%, had an initial MAADP of greater than 50, which allowed us to participate and go to surgery earlier than five days. 30%, or 64 patients, had an MAADP of less than 50, which demonstrated marked platelet inhibition. So these were our indications and parameters for early cabbage. MAADP of greater than 50, serial tag platelet mappings that demonstrated daily improvement or patient-specific clinical indications. Now, once the tag platelet mapping identified patients with minimal inhibition, we were able to reduce preoperative length of stay by 3.5 days and total length of stay by 3.6 days. Again, both were highly statistically significant. So we did a little quick dirty study on the hospital cost, the effect on that, the impact on that. 226 days, we figured we saved 816 patients of the 70% that were allowed to go early. A conservative $750 a day was estimated as the cost, not charges. Co charges would be more like $3,000, $4,000. We figured just for this one group of patients, 200 patients, we saved approximately $600,000. Again, a lot of money. So there was no difference in perioperative complications, no difference in perioperative blood product administration, no reoperations for, excuse me, there were reoperations, I'm sorry, in five patients, total of 2.2%. Three reoperations were done for surgical bleeding and two were done for coagulopathic bleeding. So we thought that Platelet mapping could safely um, guide individual patient wait times after discontinuation of dual antiplatelet therapy for patients prior to coronary surgery. More than 66% of patients were able to proceed with surgery sooner than standard recommendations without impacting complications, perioperative bleeding or transfusions. And tailoring the surgical wait times based upon TAG platelet mapping can positively impact hospital costs. Again, I'd like to thank uh, the society here for uh, the opportunity to be here and also uh, Hemanetics for the opportunity uh, to talk again. Thank you all very much for your attention.